it is my honor to have Alfred Brandl, uh, one of my absolutely favorite performers of all time. Alfred, thank you very much for joining me. Um, and we're talking today about Beethoven and your interpretations of Beethoven. And I will start um, with the first question uh, that I think is very interesting for many. You seem so at ease with Beethoven's music that it feels that you have composed this piece and you really know what Beethoven meant to say in his music. Where does the power of your interpretation come from? Do you feel it needs to be that way or were you taught and look for clues and decipher the score? These are several questions, uh, and I'll start with one. I have dealt with Beethoven all my life, of course, and not only with all his piano works, but also with his string quartets, for instance, which I have tutored frequently. To me, his works for piano are often directly connected with his ensemble music, also in terms of performance. That is very important to me. I do not believe that there is a rhythm for soloists, for instance, and a different one for ensemble players. A flexible ensemble led by an excellent conductor should be the model for the solo pianist. Within solo music, there may be a quasi-improvised patch here and there, a lead-in or a cadenza that requires freer playing. Otherwise, when dealing with one of Beethoven's sonatas, I would urge to listen to a good performance of a Beethoven quartet, if possible, one by the Bush Quartet. Strict rhythm can be full of life and does not have to be obsessively rigid. Another point is that I wasn't taught, but I gradually tried to learn to understand Beethoven's markings. They make sense to me up to 90%. His metronome indications, however, merit a question mark. The tempo should not be forced on the piece, but developed from it only when you take into account all the performance indications, the character, changes of atmosphere, and so on, within a piece. You can start to consider the metronome figures and, if necessary, modify them, as in Opus 106. <laughs> Um, Mr. Brendel, um, has the process of interpreting ever been hard uh, for you? Have you ever felt you couldn't express something you wanted to express? And how did you overcome this if it was the case? <clears throat> to understand the work is an ongoing quest. There are pieces I feel I have not solved and others that have progressed over the years. Lately, I heard Opus 109 on the radio and didn't recognize myself. It was my earliest recorded performance done in my late 20s. I was not amused. Though I stopped performing in 2008, I continue to work on pieces in my mind. A few important insights stem from old age. For instance, the awareness how important syncopations are within the rhythmical frame. But there is also some room for spontaneity. Invariably, one of my oldest musician friends told me backstage, that sounded quite differently today. <laughs> How do you approach a piece that you haven't played before? Do you study it without the score? And how do you approach a piece of music that you have played many times? 
Have you been ever overloaded with playing one composition for a long period of time? There will not be many pieces these days that you haven't already heard before on recordings of varying quality. When I sit down at the piano, I try to get a fresh impression of the piece <coughs> from reading the music, but not by imposing a version that must be different to anybody else's. Sorry, I have to cough. Of course. <coughs> You know, playing a piece often, I tried neither to unfeelingly reproduce performances of my own, nor to be obsessed with the idea I have to surprise myself. There are players of this kind. However, when I learned Schoenberg's piano concerto in 1950s, I had to discover a new continent. After two weeks of hard work, I started to move in the new territory more confidently. Um, you mentioned that um, you learned from great uh, conductors, uh, singers, string players, but the word pianist uh, is missing. So what and who in particular are you inspired by? Among pianists, it was not Horowitz or Richter, but three musicians who, though they were erratic players, could be revelatory, breathtaking, and sublime when at their best. I'm speaking of Edwin Fischer, Alfred Cortot, and Wilhelm Kempf. All three were splendid chamber musicians, two of them conductors, and one a composer. All were great cantabile players, but also produced polyphony and not just the main voice. All three were great masters of sound and balance. Listen to Fischer's Emperor Concerto with Furtwängler, to Cortot's 24 Chopin preludes in the recording of the early 30s. And Kempf's list playing, first legend from 1950, is really legendary. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And what can a pianist learn from a conductor, from a good conductor, from a good string player, and maybe from a good singer? There are pianists who are able to conduct their own playing in their mind and have an orchestral conception of color. Sheer piano sound is only a beginning. As for cantabile, it is not a matter of constant legato playing. It has to be articulated as well. And it must be an intense inner need. Mm. Oh. Mr. Brenda, what are the main sort of cliches that pianists are guilty in, in, in Beethoven? These days, fast movements are easily turned into prestissima, and there is hardly any true dolce. When Goethe met Beethoven in 1821, he summed up his impression I've never seen an artist more concentrated, more energetic, or more heartfelt. For once, the personal impression tallies with the qualities of Beethoven's music. Um, have you ever found that you are um, conducted your fingers? Have you ever talked uh, to your fingers? Yeah. I've never been a conductor myself, but I find it often crucial that the performance is conductible. Nuances that are impossible for an orchestra to produce or impossible for the conductor to conduct are often superfluous. 
I didn't talk to my fingers, but I have tried to make them talk even more frequently. I tried to make them sing. <laughs> so when you went on stage performing, did you require any mental preparation? And um, if yes, what was that? I must confess that I do not sympathize with pianists who appear on stage, fidget around on their chair, rub their hands uh, and knees, just sit down and play and adjust the piano stool beforehand. <laughs> uh, good, good advice indeed. In, in your Guardian article, an A to Z of the piano, you wrote, it is a relatively simple to analyze the composition with the help of the written text, more difficult to feel the form and even more demanding to enter into the psychology of a work. Yes, I would still say that, and I would add, it is much harder than people think to read the musical text properly and make sense of the composer's markings, particularly with Beethoven. What he wrote down is essential and very revealing. Don't feel entitled to do your own thing with it. As Edwin Fischer wrote, uh, bring the pieces to life without violating them. <laughs> so wh what advice therefore you have for younger uh, generations? Uh, just a few. Uh, <laughs> stay abreast with the music of your time. Don't treat music as if it were a branch of the fashion industry. Get good tuition in composing, both in traditional harmony and in the possibilities of a music that has left tonality. And finally, don't practice too much. You can ruin yourself by overwork. I have another question um, about um, composers. So do you have any idea why composers, especially Beethoven, chose particular tonalities for their language? Do you find any connection in Beethoven's majors and minors and the way he uses the tonality in his music? Um, in your recent interview, I heard there was a joke about uh, Beethoven wanting to kill Mozart to own C minor or like a, a, some, something similar. Yes, it is not generally known that young Beethoven killed Mozart when he was asleep on the lawn and happily went away with the key of C minor. Now, the strange thing is that humorous music can often be found in C major. Think of Beethoven's Diabelli Variations, the big cadenza of the C major piano concerto, the Adagio Grazioso of his Sonata Opus 31, number one, and the finale of Haydn's late C major sonata. Beautiful. And finally, could you tell us a little bit more about um, Edwin Fischer, such an icon? What were your strongest memories of him? When Fischer was at his best, the contact with music was direct and immediate. There was no curtain before his soul. His playing could sometimes be frenzied, but no one has ever exhaled more perfectly in the adagios. Listen to the recording of the Largo in Bach's F minor concerto. I can never listen to it without getting tears in my eyes. As a teacher, it was his example that encouraged us not to take things apart, but rather to connect the components, 
see the context of the whole and show how a piece leads from the first note to the last. Among older conductors, it was particularly his friend Furtwängler who could also convey the completeness of a piece. Listen to Furtwängler's recordings of Schubert's great symphonies or Wagner's Tristan. Mr. Brengler, thank you very much. It was wonderful. And thank you very much for your answers and your time. It was absolute pleasure. It was a pleasure. And uh, I wish you to have uh, uh, great satisfaction with, in dealing with Beethoven and with yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much.